as we mentioned a few times, it is very important that you choose the right number of components in Parafax because the model is going to change with the number of components. So we cannot just choose, say, 10 components and just look at the first five ones. They're going to be different from just doing a five component model. And on top of that, if we do have a five component Parafax model, and fitting then a 10 component model is going to be numerically complicated and probably impossible uh, because Parafax runs into problems when we take way too many components in for numerical reasons. So we really have to choose the number of components carefully, more carefully than we do in PCA. Uh, and we're going to talk about that uh, here and we're also going to talk about determining outliers. Not so much, uh, because it's not uh, that difficult in Parafax, or at least not very different from what we're used to. There are a number of tools that we can use for determining the number of components <coughs> in Parafax. One way to think of it is that we can do whatever we do for PCA, we can also do that for Parafax. But then uh, we have a number of extra uh, uh, available diagnostics and tools that we can use. So from that perspective, it is simpler to determine the number of components in Parafax than it is in PCA. So for example, we can use cross-validation, or we can use scree tests, where we look at the variance explained or residual variance as a function of the number of components, all the methods that we use in PCA. But then we have a, a number of different tools, and the most important ones are called split half analysis and the core consistency. And we're going to talk quite a bit uh, about these ones. Uh, but of course, looking at the model and making sure that it makes sense is also very important. Uh, just to start with the traditional approaches uh, from PCA, one of them is cross validation. We can do that in uh, Parafax, but actually if you look into the literature and look at what people do, you will find that very, very few people use cross-validation. Um, it's not a, a commonly used tool. We do have algorithms uh, for doing cross-validation, but we hardly uh, ever use those. So that's not the method of choice uh, when we talk about um, determining the number of components in Parafax. One that is, though, is the core consistency. And in order to explain the core consistency, we need to look at the so-called Tucker-free model, which is a little bit complicated. But um, let's try and see if we can explain the Tucker-free model. The Tucker-free model looks a little bit similar uh, to the Parafax model. We have scores for the samples. We have loadings for this mode and loadings for this mode. But then, on top of that, we have this little small thing here, which is called the core array. It corresponds a little bit to the singular values in a singular value decomposition. So if you're familiar with a singular value decomposition, then this freeway array here is very similar to the singular uh, value matrix in SVD. What it does is that it has numbers in here. so Instead of just having component 1 times component 2 times component 3, we multiply this by some number here, so giving the magnitude. And therefore, we often normalize the scores, the loadings, and the loadings. They are all normalized, and the variance is in this core array. Well, let's see how we can do Parafax this way. We can actually write the Parafax model as a kind of a Tucker-free model. In this particular situation, then, we would only have non-zero numbers on this super diagonal. So it would simply be 1, 1, 1, if I had a free component model. So if I did have a free component model, I would have 1, 2, 3 columns here. And in order to calculate the first component, I would do this column times this one, times this one, times the one here. And the second one would be this, 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 times the second one here. So you see, we can write a Parafax model as a special kind of Tucker-free model, where we only have a super diagonal of ones. Uh, 
But in the Tucker free model itself, it's not just the super diagonal. It's all the different elements of the core array here that are non-zero. And this is a little bit confusing at first because what that means is that we have, for example, an interaction term, we could call it, of component 1 times component 2 times component 2 times some number here in the off super diagonal. So if I have a free component model, free components here, free and free, this core array would be a free by free by free array. So that would be 3 times 3 times 3, that's 27. 27 different combinations. All combinations of scores with all combinations of these loadings with all combinations of these loadings. This is very complex uh, when you think about it. So instead of just having free components like in Parafac, this talk of free model would actually have 27 different kinds of components, but they would be special because they were just combinations of free scores, free loadings, and free uh, loadings in the third mode. It is not that complicated, in fact, because many of these numbers are going to be small in a Tucker free model. But that's beyond the scope here, um, because we're just using the Tucker free model here uh, to build this core consistency diagnostic. The thing is, the Tucker free model fits better than the Parafac model. It's a different kind of model than the Parafac model. And in some sense, it's a more general model. It can fit more variation to the data. Now, the core consistency, what it does is that it takes a Parafac model, ABC, and checks if that variation is really just lying on the super diagonal here. If it's just lying on the super diagonal, it really is a nice Parafac model. But if I take too many components and start fitting noise, then I will find that that variation is not just lying on the super diagonal, but lying all over the core array here. So what we do in the core consistency is that we get A, B, and C from Parafac, and then we check if the core array that would fit the data is similar to what it should be. So if I get a core array that looks like a super diagonal of 1s, I say the core consistency is 100. But if I take my Parafac ABC and calculate a core array and it ends up like this, where the super diagonal is not exactly 1 and where there are off diagonal elements, then I can get a low core consistency, so a low similarity to the target. It can even be negative. And that tells me that this model is not valid because it's not low rank trilinear. It has other kinds of information. So we check if the A, B, and C behave as they're supposed to, following a super diagonal of ones or not. And what we expect is that if we use a low number of components up to the right one, the core consistency is going to be high. But if we take too many components, then the core consistency will be low. So, the way we check the number of components is that we start with small number of components, and then we increase until the core consistency becomes low. And low means way smaller than 100%. So, for example, 0% would be low, or negative would be low. If I get, say, 50%, that's actually what I would call an annoying model, because there seems to be something, but it's not exactly right. So we hope that we get core consistencies of 100, 90, 80, until it drops off and becomes zero. That would be a clear situation. Now here's some examples, mainly just to show you that the core consistency works reasonably well. These are completely different kinds of data just to show that it will work on many different kinds of data. The Cars and Stars data set is an old data set from Psychometrics, where different superstars like Muhammad Ali are investigated as to how they reinforce the impression people have of certain cars like a Ford Mustang, uh, etc. 
Um, so that's a psychometric data set. Sugar is a fluorescence data set. Tongue data is a psychometric data set, fluorescence data set, a sensory data set, and a chromatographic data set. All of these have been investigated in the literature. And what you see in bold here is the number of components that were chosen in the original papers. Sometimes it took a lot of investigations to find the right number of components, uh, but in any case, the bold line indicates the number of components that were chosen. To the right here, we see the core consistency, and you see that for this data set, one and two components have high core consistencies, so we picked the two component model. And that's also uh, what was picked in the original publication. Here, amino acid data has three components and then a small one. Here is actually something interesting where we see that with three components we get um, what I would call an annoying uh, core consistency. It's not as high as we would like it to be, but on the other hand it's not as close to zero as we would like to, ha like to have it to reject it. So basically somehow what the core consistency says is that we have what we could call a two and a half component model. It's more than two, but three components are not really nice. And that's also what was uh, sort of determined in the original paper. And the same goes for this one. So what you see is that the core consistency seems to work pretty well. Uh, and actually works better than, for example, looking at the um, explained variants or something like that. But, and this is important, it is not a bulletproof uh, method. And in general, when you look into the literature and look at papers, people tend to trust the core consistency way too much. It is just a diagnostic, and it's just a tool that can guide you a little bit. But the actual decision has to be based on more than just looking at the core consistency. Now, for example, the core consistency can go wrong because of outliers. It can also go wrong, uh, for example, uh, if you have a very, very precise data. So actually for very simple data, perfectly uh, simulated data, for example, the core consistency doesn't behave as nicely as it does for most real data sets. But the main point is just that the core consistency is not a proof of the number of components. You have to decide the number of components. And, and the core consistency is just a helpful tool not the solution, not present in the red samples. So if I split my data in a stupid way, I might not be able to find all my components in these samples, but only in these samples. So in order to avoid problems with that, we often try to do split half analysis using two different splits. So we try this and we try this. And in general, we just look at the one that works the best. So maybe this one doesn't work, and that could be due to unfortunate splitting. Well, if this one works, we're happy. So basically, a positive result from the split half analysis is judged as being positive, whereas a negative result is not really that negative. That can happen for various sampling-related uh, issues. So usually we split our data in two different ways and look at the best one. Here's an example. Here we have a small data set, and we fit a, a Parafac model two component to this data set. This is a fluorescence data set. And in the emission mode, we get these loadings. And in the excitation mode, we get these. On the other subset, so completely independent samples, we get these emission loadings and these excitation loadings. And you see that they are very, very similar. So that indicates that two components are useful. If I do a free component model, you can see that this red component is actually not at all the same in the emission mode and not at all the same in the excitation mode. So probably a free component model is not useful for this data set. That's the idea in um, um, split half analysis. One thing you have to be careful about is that you have to split the data so that the samples are independent of each other. You cannot, for example, have all the blue ones being one replicate. 
you know, replicate one of all the samples and the brown one being replicate two of all the samples. That would be cheating because the samples are not independent of each other anymore. And then it would very often be just trivial that they gave the same solution. So you have to use independent uh, samples. This was a little bit about choosing the number of components. Now before we end this uh, part, uh, we'll talk a little bit about outlier detection. But we're not going to talk too much about it, and mainly because we really just use all the same tools that we are used to from um, uh, ordinary multivariate models like PCA, etc. We use residual analysis, so we look at the residuals of our model to find strange samples. And we use influence analysis, like looking at leverages or um, hotelings T-squared and, and things like that, uh, based on scores and loadings from our models. Every time we build a model of a freeware array, we can subtract the model from the data, from X, and we get an array of residuals. So it has this residual array has exactly the same size as our data because we get one residual for every measurement. And we can look at that one in all the same ways that we do for our data. We can plot it like spectra if we have spectral data. We can plot it in landscapes. Or we can even uh, look at the um, squared values. So we can take the square of the residuals and look at it. We can sum them over one mode or two modes, or we can even sum them over all the modes. That's how we get the variance explained, by looking at the sum of all the squared residuals relative to the sum of all the squared data. That tells us how much we haven't uh, uh, explained in the model. Here's just one example from a sensory data set, uh, where we have a freeway array of sensory data that we use for predicting something. Uh, so in this case we have different foods uh, and they are assessed by different judges, assessors, and different uh, using different attributes. Now if I take all the residuals in a particular model here and I sum the squared residuals across food, I get a matrix and I can see that there's one particular element here that is high and that's Assessor number six, that apparently has problems with attribute number three. So we can identify a certain problem there. We can talk to the assessor. We can retrain the panel, sensory panel, to improve. Or, or we can just remove that particular column of the freeware array in order to not bias our solution based on this uh, single assessor that has problems with it. That was the residuals. Well, we can also look at scores and loadings. We can calculate leverages. We can calculate hotelings T-squared. And we can do all the kinds of diagnostics that we do for the ordinary uh, two-way analysis as well.